Horst Fischer was one of the doctors who awaited the arrival of trains at Auschwitz-Birkenau. Alongside the likes of Josef Mengele, he decided who would live on in the camp as a slave labourer and who would die in the gas chamber. Thus, he was directly responsible for thousands of deaths. This is his story. Horst Paul Sylvester Filcher was born on the 31st December 1912 in Dresden. After the death of his parents, Horst Fischer grew up as an orphan in Berlin with his uncle. His uncle was a nationalist and he raised his nephew in this manner, thus indoctrinating him into eventual disaster. The young Fischer belonged to the Bundescher Jugend, a nationalist scouting organisation for young people. In 1932, after finishing school, Fischer began studying medicine at the University of Berlin, which he completed in 1937. On the 1st of November 1933, he joined the SS, SS number 293937, and on the 18th of October 1937, he applied for admission to the Nazi party and was accepted retroactively as from the 1st of May 1937, membership number 5370971. At the start of the Second World War, Fischer was initially deployed as a troop doctor for the Waffen-SS in Oranienburg, Dachau and Stralsund. He took part in the attack on the Soviet Union. During this time in the army, he caught pulmonary tuberculosis, an infectious disease spread by bacteria. As a result, he was sent to a sanatorium to recover. Whilst there, Fischer met Enno Lolling, the head of Office D3 of the SS Main Economic and Administrative Office, which looked after medical services and camp hygiene. Therefore, Lolling was the boss of all the doctors working in concentration camps. As doctors had to be present during gassings, he would have received reports on them. According to Marek Josef Orski, in The Destruction of Prisoners in the Stutthof Concentration Camp by the Poison Gas Cyclone B, Lolling told doctors under his command that if they were ordered to be present at a mass murder or to carry out the killing themselves, then they had to do it. Lolling committed suicide in May 1945. Fischer agreed to Lolling's offer to be sent to a concentration camp to expand his expertise and a few months later he was sent to Auschwitz. There were cases where doctors went to Auschwitz and they were shocked when they arrived at what they saw. One doctor, thinking that this was just another posting, even went there with his wife. However, as it was Lolling who recruited Fischer, I think that Fischer knew precisely what to expect. Horst Fischer arrived at Auschwitz on the 6th of November 1942. Here he was directly subordinate to the site doctor, Edward Wirtz. Wirtz was also a personal friend. Edward Wirtz was in charge of all the doctors at Auschwitz. Like Fischer and Mengele, he had been invalided out of the army. In his case, it was due to a heart complaint. A qualified doctor and serving SS man, he was first posted to the Dachau concentration camp in April 1942. In July 1942, Wirtz became the head camp doctor at Neuengamme concentration camp. On the 1st of September 1942, he was posted to Auschwitz. As medical director at Auschwitz, Wirtz was organisationally involved in the murder of the old, sick and weak prisoners as part of Action 14F13. He assigned other doctors to carry out selections for newly arriving prisoner transports in order to decide who would live and who would die. Sometimes he also made the selections personally, especially when the camp was particularly busy with new transports. He was also responsible for selecting prisoners for use in medical experiments and overseeing those experiments. However, there was another side to his character and he would intervene to save prisoners and it was his intervention that improved the hygiene conditions at the camp. After the evacuation of Auschwitz in January 1945, Wirtz was posted to Mittelbau Dora, Bergen-Belsen and Neuengamme. He committed suicide in American captivity in 1945. It's an irony of history that whereas everyone has heard of Mengele, Wirtz is largely unknown. I will do a separate video on Wirtz at a later date. In 1943, Fischer was promoted to SS Hauptsturmführer. 
Fischer was initially a troop doctor at Auschwitz and also at the Janina Gruber and Jawiszowicz camps. Janina Gruber, today Libyon's Mauer in Poland, was a camp which held prisoners who worked in three coal mines as well as British prisoners of war. Jawiszowicz, today Jawiszowicz in Poland, was a subcamp of Auschwitz where prisoners worked in coal mines. At these camps it would seem that Fischer did not come into contact with the inmates, except perhaps the British prisoners of war. Later Fischer became the successor to Friedrich Entres in his role as camp doctor at the production facility of IG Farben on the Bunewerke site at the Auschwitz III Monowitz camp. He started this position as from November 1943, at the latest. At Auschwitz Monowitz, Fischer was responsible for carrying out selections of prisoners, those being unfit, in his opinion, being sent to their murder. Thaddeus S., an inmate doctor, referred to Horst Fischer and Friedrich Entres as the worst murderers, with faces like priests, but ice cold. Horst Fischer eventually became the deputy site doctor at Auschwitz. As from the end of May 1944, trainloads of Jewish people from Hungary began to arrive at Auschwitz. This created a problem for the doctors at the camp. There were not enough doctors to be on call in order to decide who should live and who should die. The head of the medical staff, Edward Wietz, demanded that the pharmacists also attend at the ramp, but to increase efficiency he decreed that the 24-hour shifts be replaced by 12-hour shifts. Many of the doctors present took to drink, particularly those that had to work through the night, so that by the end of their shift they were making decisions on who should live and who should die through a drunken haze. On the 21st of June 1944, Fischer was promoted to Hauptsturmführer, making him one of the highest ranking SS doctors at Auschwitz. In September 1944, Hans Wilhelm Koenig succeeded him as camp doctor in Monowitz. As well as selections for death, Fischer ordered punishments, mainly whippings for small infractions of camp rules. These whippings could also lead to death. Fischer is reported to have said, We have gone so far that we can no longer go back. This can be interpreted morally, as the Spiegel did many years later in a 1988 article. The evil could no longer be undone. Interpreted psychologically, this means anyone who runs a murderous machine for a certain amount of time is no longer able to stop. Because atrocity begets atrocity. Continuing to kill becomes a psychological necessity in order to justify that very killing and see it as something other than what it really is. Horst Fischer knew Josef Mengele well. They first met in the summer of 1941 when he served as a doctor in the SS Viking Division in the invasion of the Soviet Union. Fischer gave information on Mengele during his interrogation and at his trial. During our first meeting, which was very superficial and short, Mengele gave the impression of a humble man, very closed and composed, Fischer said. The next time they met was in Auschwitz. Like Fischer, Mengele had been sent away from the front as he was wounded. Like Fischer, he had volunteered for Auschwitz. We often met outside of work hours and attended celebrations with other SS doctors, he said. Contrary to my initial impression, in Auschwitz, Mengele was full of confidence and took the lead in conversations. Of all of us, he was the most convinced of the need to exterminate the Jews. Mengele believed in the conspiracy theory that it was the Jews of Galicia who were responsible for Germany's defeat in World War I. Fischer said later in court that Mengele argued that it was precisely amongst these Galician Jews in whom Western and degenerate Judaism is being renewed biologically and therefore must be included in the final solution. Mengele was keen to be at the ramp but he also welcomed the reduction in the shift from a 24-hour shift to a 12-hour shift which would give him more time for his work as the camp doctor at Birkenau. Fischer added Mengele also demanded that twins from the selections be kept back and reserved for him for the purpose of his own research. Mengele spoke with enthusiasm about his scientific work in the Auschwitz concentration camp. In private meetings he would show us photographs with special characteristics of gypsies and twins. He said, among other things, that a pathological anatomy unit had been set up in crematorium 2 of the Birkenau camp where a doctor and a taxidermist worked for him. I myself saw in the autumn of 1944 body parts kept in glass containers in the basement of the Auschwitz I detention building. Mengele told me he had ordered his staff to prepare for him preserved organs and body parts of twins. To that end, twins were killed. 
unknown as to how many for the purpose of preserving their body parts. Fisher also revealed that in 1944, Mengele received instructions from the chief SX doctor at the time, Dr. Edward Vietz, to select inmates with anthropological and racial characteristics to preserve their bodies for future studies at a research institute. He also said, I remember one time the doctors were talking about the selection to the inmates' brothel. Mengele was responsible for making sure that the selected inmates had a thorough medical checkup. Towards the end of the war, as the Red Army was approaching, the SS officers who were tasked with destroying the crematorium fled. Mengele took care of blowing up the crematorium himself. After the end of the war, Fisher had his SS blood group tattoo removed and settled down to life as a doctor under his real name in Gotso, near Grandenburg and der Havel, and later using a different name, Spreenhagen, Fustenwalde district, as a country doctor. This was in the Soviet zone, later to become East Germany. He got married, he had four children. So much time went by that perhaps he no longer believed that anything would happen to him. However, investigations were underway in West Germany. Whilst crimes at Auschwitz were being studied, in 1959 his name came up. On the 6th of April 1960, the War Crimes Investigations Unit in Ludwigsburg issued a warrant for Fischer's arrest, but failed to locate his whereabouts. At this time, the border between East and West Berlin was still open. One could cross just by entering the U-Bahn or some other form of public transport, or indeed on foot. However, Fischer made a serious mistake. He made some anti-East German remarks in West Berlin which came to the attention of the Stasi which had its spies everywhere. Thus, he came onto their radar. However, it took until April 1964 for the Stasi to get the full picture. Despite Cold War tensions, when it came to hunting Nazi war criminals, East and West Germany normally collaborated with each other. In this case, the East Germans contacted the West German authorities about Fischer, and the West German officials handed over everything they had on him. On the 11th of June 1965, the Stasi arrested Fischer under the pretense of investigating a hit-and-run accident. Fearing that he would try to flee or commit suicide, the East German officials did not reveal their actual investigation until Fischer had been remanded to the Hohenschönhausen prison. There, Fischer was interrogated over a period of seven months. The trial against Fischer took place in March 1966 before the Supreme Court of East Germany under the chairmanship of President Heinrich Töplitz. Töplitz was born on the 5th of June 1914 in Berlin, he studied law in Breslau but was not permitted to practice as according to the Nuremberg laws he was of mixed Jewish race. He fled Nazi Germany in 1938 but he returned during the war. As he was not allowed to serve in the Wehrmacht, he was conscripted into the tort organisation and used as a construction worker first in France and then in the Netherlands from April 1944 until the end of the war in 1945. After three months in Soviet captivity, he returned to Berlin. From 1951 to 1990, he was a member of the People's Chamber, the pseudo-parliament of East Germany, and he headed the Supreme Court from 1960 to 1986. Wolfgang Vergel acted as Horst Fischer's legal advisor. 
Virgil had a very colourful life and was chiefly known then for his activities in Cold War prisoner exchanges. It was not known at the time, but it later turned out that he was a Stasi agent. It surprises me that no one's done a film on Virgil. His life was so interesting. A spy, the spy exchanges and other things that he got up to. I even thought of doing a video on him, but then realised there was no way I could check the information, so I've given up on that one. The trial of Fisher was stage managed by the Stasi, and this was meant not so much to be against Fisher himself, but more to put on trial West Germany and companies such as IG Farben and its collaboration with the SS. Evidence was lacking, but Fisher, possibly hoping for a sentence reduction, or maybe resigned to his fate, provided the information. He provided next to no defence. His personal records and sketches were also used as evidence, as you can see in this photograph from the 11th of March 1966 of what appears to be a plan of Auschwitz-Birkenau and Fischer, who is explaining what is happening. Fischer had fully cooperated with the investigation and the trial. He admitted that the murders and the Holocaust overall were premeditated. He said deportees were exploited for slave labour until they were no longer capable of working and then gassed. Despite his cooperation and honesty, he was sentenced to death. A plea for clemency was sent to the chairman of the state council, Walter Ulbricht, but this was refused. Fischer was executed by guillotine in the central execution site at Leipzig on the 8th of July 1966. He became the last person to be executed by beheading outside of France. His remains were cremated and he was buried in an unmarked grave. There are a number of videos on this channel relating to war criminals and most of these videos end up with the criminal either getting away with it or a very soft sentence. You may be thinking that in West Germany Nazi criminals had nothing to fear whilst in East Germany they were hunted down. This is a common belief. How true was it? Well, let's have a look at the evidence at least as far as Auschwitz is concerned. East Germany was in existence from the 7th of October 1949 to the 3rd of October 1990. In that time, only 15 criminals from Auschwitz were sentenced. The death penalty was imposed and carried out twice. Three of the concentration camp murderers who were sentenced to life died in custody. The remaining 10 were amnestied. In West Germany... At the Frankfurt Auschwitz trials alone, 23 perpetrators were sentenced to long or life sentences in five trials between 1963 and 1981. I think that the lack of interest in East Germany can be explained. The Stasi probably caught many Holocaust perpetrators in East Germany but turned them around to becoming agents for them or for using the skills that they had in order to repress the people of East Germany. Fischer could possibly have ended up like this too had West Germany not issued a warrant for his arrest and brought him to public attention. He also had use as a participant in a show trial. What about the information on Mengele that the East Germans gathered from Fischer? Was this passed on to West Germany, Israel or the United States or indeed any of the countries where Mengele could be hiding? No. That information was put on file and locked away in a filing cabinet to be discovered by historians many years later. I hope you found this video interesting. The Holocaust is my specialist area in history and there's a number of videos on it on this channel and I will continue to make more of them. I live in Poland and Germany and you will find here original research. I upload every Friday at 2000 hours my time. I can also upload on other days as well and the best way to know when I'll be uploading is to subscribe. One video I am preparing, in fact I've been preparing this since January of 2019, is to detail what happened to Mengele from the end of the Second World War until the moment he got on the ship to, for South America. But that's already taken a very long time, almost five years now, and it's likely to continue to take much longer. But in the meantime, I'm doing lots of other videos as well. So for the moment, thanks for listening and all the best from me.